Uh, my name's Ian Shaw. If I'd been sitting at home by the fire with a glass of wine, as I said to some friends just, I certainly would not have come. So <laughs> thank you very much indeed. And one of my friends over there said it better be worth it. And I'm... <laughs> So first of all, before we move on, we've got to understand what SAFE is. And we've got to understand what regulatory toxicologists and regulatory scientists think SAFE is. So we can just get this sort of general idea of SAFE before we start. And you have come here today, you've walked through the rain and God knows what else, you've crossed the road and you've taken all sorts of risks to get here. And you could have been run over on the way. Uh, I'm glad that you weren't. If you got your car, you, got, you came in the car, you got into the car, you didn't think am I going to get killed on the way to that lecture by Ian Shaw? But, you know, if you look at the New Zealand road statistics, the chances of getting killed are really quite great, actually, because uh, the numbers here from 2010 ran to 2013, between sort of 45 and 80 people get killed on the road each day. So, sort of by, uh, by each year, by definition, we're sort of regarding that as safe. So then we need to look at some food statistics, perhaps. And if we look at the food statistics, one particular statistic is a disease that we're all hearing about a lot on the news at the moment because of the Havelock North uh, issues with their water contaminated with Campylobacter. If you look at Campylobacteriosis, which is the disease caused by Campylobacter, every year well, one or two people die of that disease. Now, we get all very worried about that and say, how dare they kill us with Campylobacter in our food? The government's useless. But we don't say, how dare they kill us in our cars? So we've got to get this risk ratio right. So there are very few people that die of food-related food issues in New Zealand. We're going to talk about more of those uh, sorts of issues a little bit uh, later on. And if we continue that thinking around Campylobacter and Campylobacteriosis, just to get the idea that New Zealand does have a bit of a problem here. It's not as great a problem now as it was when these data were collected, but I haven't got the more up-to-date data. You can't obtain them just yet. But these data are all over the place, but they give you a rough idea. So New Zealand has a much greater incidence of Campylobacter than England and Wales, Australia, Denmark, Canada, or the USA. And I always make jokes about this, Campylobacter is a good native species, it's endemic to New Zealand, we've got to look after it. And you're keeping it nicely living in your gut and cattle are doing exactly the same. We're going to explore that as well in a few minutes' time. But before we do that, I want to get more scientific about safety. And just consider the word risk, because a lot of people use this word and they use it incorrectly. And I'm going to use it quite a lot uh, in my talk today. So I want us all to have a, an idea what risk actually is. There was a great bloke called Theophrastus von Hohenheim Paracelsus who was living in the late, 15, uh, late 1400s to mid 1500s. And he was basically the first toxicologist. He's the grandpappy of all the toxicologists. And he made a quite an important statement, which is written in Old German, actually, but I'm going to show you the translation. He said, all things are poisons, there's nothing which is not a poison, it's the dose which makes the thing safe. So what he's basically saying is, if you take enough of something, it will kill you. But if something's particularly toxic, and you take a minute little amount of it, it won't kill you. And I did a TV program some years ago where we tried this out, and the producer was very worried because she clearly didn't understand risk. I took some potassium cyanide, which is deeply, deeply toxic. And I took one gram of this and I dissolved it into a litre of water. I took one milliliter of that and put it into a litre of water. And I took one milliliter of that and put it into a litre of water. I poured it into a glass and drank it. And that's perfectly okay. The cyanide's incredibly toxic, but the dose that I got, the concentration, was so very low that I survived. It tasted of almonds and I got very worried in case I got the calculation wrong, I must say. <laughs> But people like me get very boring about risk and we get mathematical about it. Actually, I don't get too mathematical. Uh, but this is the equation for risk. Risk equals hazard times exposure. I'm going to get off all this stuff in a minute and talk about food. But we just want to get the idea of risk across first. Risk is a probabilistic thing based on the intrinsic properties of something. How much harm it might cause you. So if we think about potassium cyanide, it has an incredibly high hazard. But if my exposure to it was low, the risk would be low. So in the experiment I did on that TV program, the, my risk was very low because my exposure uh, was incredibly low. So you might have something with a very high hazard, but if the level of it's very small, for example in food, the risk from that food is very low. And this can be illustrated, I think, quite nicely. There's some pictures a, a colleague of mine drew for me a little while ago. And this, this dog is an incredibly vicious dog. 
and it will eat you because it hasn't been fed for three or four days. And in this position here, it's got a particular hazard, and the hazard is fixed. The dog wants to eat. You go up to the dog, it will eat you. The same dog, the same hazard, put into a cage with the door sort of shut a little bit. The hazard's the same, but the risk is lower because for the dog to get to you, it's got to open the cage door. Now, that's no big deal because any dog would pull that open. But at the top, look, we've got the same dog, so the hazard is the same, but it's in a cage with the door locked. There, the hazard's high, the risk is zero because you can't get exposed to it. So even if you have a very, very high hazard, you can still have a near zero risk providing the exposure is low. So that's the end of my sermon about risk. You sort of understand the ideas of risk now. We'll begin to talk about some of those uh, risks in food. Now I'm a chemist, a, a biochemist, a toxicologist, and I venture into microbiology every now and again, and I get told off for this because I'm told that I don't understand it well enough, which is probably true, but I've got to be careful because microbiological implications of food are really very important indeed. And we've got to balance this quite nicely. So I want to, in my talk today, sort of compare and contrast a bit the microbiological stuff against the, the chemistry. And just looking at some of these wonderful creatures. I mean, as a chemist, I really respect these creatures. They can kill you stone dead. This is Campylobacter, which has a really nice sort of squiggly shape. This is Listeria, which is a fantastic bacterium because it loves to grow at 4 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature of the refrigerator. And of course, we all think what to do with food to keep it fresh. You put it in the bloody fridge, don't you? Well, it's not very good with that because it grows even faster. And it grows in cheeses, particularly soft cheeses, and it causes abortions, which is very sad. And that's a problem uh, why um, pregnant women are advised not to eat um, soft cheeses. This is norovirus, which is the commonest foodborne um, causative agent in the world. And I would suspect that every single one of you has had norovirus at some stage. And in the States, about 10 years ago, they did a big experiment with hundreds of thousands of people where they measured the antibodies to norovirus in, in them. And they found 98% people had, 98 of the people had antibodies, which meant they'd pretty well all been exposed. And this down here, here is called E. coli 0157. I'm going to talk about that one a little bit more in a few minutes' time. And then later on, a nice little molecule in this... Uh, a flask here, and for the chemists out there, they're all saying, that's a bad molecule to choose, because that molecule is actually red, and I've got it in a green solution. And that's because I couldn't find a red solution to put up there. So basically, the difference between microbiological effects and chemical effects is acute versus chronic. So the microbiological effects tend to cause things quickly, within 10, 5, 10, 11 days whereas the chemical effects tend to be a very, very long period of time. So let, let's explore that a little bit more, and you can see this little bloke here is showing the... It's going to be a horrible lecture, I can tell you. There are worse pictures than this. I'll warn you if I remember when they're coming. This little man here is uh, suffering the terrors of having eaten something with perhaps norovirus in, and if you read the symptoms of norovirus uh, food poisoning, it says projectile vomiting. Have you eaten dinner? <laughs> and this is supposed to illustrate an old person because the effects of chemical toxicity, particularly in food, would take a very, very long time to manifest. And we often don't notice those things, which is why I want to concentrate a little bit on those later. But I thought, as a good toxicologist, I need to show you, in fact, that some of the uh, foodborne illnesses caused by bacteria are actually caused by chemicals and toxins in those bacteria. So it's all down to toxicology. And that's part of my um, reason for living to prove that. So if we look at Escherichia coli, which is a bacterium uh, that is present in the gut, it's present in all of your guts, in every bit of your gut. One of my PhD students here is uh, studying it. Where is he? You're there. Studying it at the moment. And you can find it all the way down the gut. But there's a very specific strain of it, uh, E. coli 0157, which is just a little bit different. And if you get exposed to that one, you do all sorts of horrible things and spend a long time in the toilet, basically. But I want to explain why that is, what actually happens, uh, why you get so sick with it. It's got another name, and its other name is STEC, and that stands for Shiga Toxin Producing Escherichia coli, and that's suggesting that it's producing a particular toxin, and it is. 
but it's a very weird toxin for it to produce because the toxin it produces, which is called Shiga toxin, as you probably guessed, is produced by another bacterium called Shigella dysenterii, and that's the bacterium that causes dysentery. We're getting there, don't worry. We will get to the end of this story in a minute. So how on earth does Professor Kiyoshi's Shiga toxin, which he discovered in 1897, get into a completely different bacterium? And even worse than that, a bacterium that we've normally got in our gut. And therefore, if you looked under the microscope, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them. The only way you can do it is by doing fairly sophisticated immunological or, or genetic uh, work. So let's have a look at that toxin, and then we'll see where it actually comes from and how it gets there. Again, as a biochemist, I love um, the chemistry of proteins, and Shiga toxin is a fairly smallish protein which consists of two halves. So these, are, these coily things here are all amino acids, all called up in big long rows, and there's two basic sections which are joined by a bridging unit here. And those two sections are called, we're very um, inventive in uh, biochemistry, they're called uh, subunit A and subunit B. And there's something very special about those subunits, very clever, because subunit B actually binds to the outside of a cell, and subunit A enters the cell and stops proteins being made in the cell. For the biochemist amongst you, it binds to a specific site on the ribosome and prevents proteins being made. This is lethal. If this gets into a cell, it kills the cell pretty well dead. So you don't need many molecules of this to, to wreak havoc in a biological system. But how is it made? If you look at a bacterium, and this could, this could be E. coli, it's just a generalised bacterium, the bacteria has a big strand of, a uh, circular strand of DNA, which codes for all the things the bacterium needs. So it codes for all the enzymes and all that sort of stuff that it needs to survive. But it also has a series of little uh, rings of DNA called plasmids. And these little rings of DNA code for all sorts of bits and pieces. And for example, the uh, Shiga toxin is coded for on one of these rings of DNA. And they're just little circles of DNA, very small compared with the bacterial genome. So the code, for example, for Shiga toxin could be on one of those. So how does it get into the wrong bacterium? It's very simple. If you've got two bacteria living in the gut, living in the soil, living in an animal, and one of them happens to be Shigella dysenterii with its Shiga toxin um, plasmid and its, its big uh, circle of DNA doing all the things that the bacterium needs to do. And in the same environment, there's an E. coli bacterium, which doesn't have any plasmids in my diagram here, but it does actually have them in reality. And then these two get together on a Friday night, make friends, do a bit of conjugation. And during that conjugation process, the Shiga, Shigella uh, bacterium can pass the Shiga toxin plasmid over to the E. coli. So then we've got a very nasty situation because we've got an E. coli that can manufacture Shiga toxin, not what we would expect. But even worse, when that uh, STEC, that E. coli that can manufacture Shiga toxin reproduces, it also reproduces the plasmid. That happened in the United States in the 19. 80s, late 1980s, and a whole new clone of bacteria were developed, and they're now moving all the way around the world. And we get cases of uh, STEC uh, food poisoning in New Zealand reasonably frequently. I like to have a diverse approach to uh, lecturing, and if, for those of you who don't know, this is a cow, and that is cow poo. And the reason I show you that is E. coli is present, as I said, in the gut of animals, and they poo it out the other end. I know there's no need to show you these pictures, but isn't Google fantastic? I just Googled cow, actually it was another word, but I'll put poo in now, and it came up with that, which is fantastic. So this cow poo has got in it uh, E. coli, and so if that cow was infected with STEC, with E. coli carrying the Shigella uh, plasmid, that would also be in the poo. Now, if that cow goes to slaughter, the cow doesn't sort of stand there and say, kill me, I want you to have me for my dinner. It moves around a bit, and it might poo, and that poo might get onto the floor, might get onto the animal's skin, and then when the animal's carved up in the works, some of that bacteria from the poo could well end up on the uh, meat. And then we've got a pretty difficult situation. So just imagine, here's some cow meat, and it's contaminated with E. coli 0157, now, if I was to cook that in a frying pan really hot, 
it will be killed, the bacterium. It's killed at very low temperatures. So, you know, 60, 70 it will be killed very easily indeed. But it would only be killed because it's on the outside of that meat. But if I mashed up the meat and made um, mince, then the outside might become the inside. And if I then make patties out of that mince and then cook the patties with a sort of, it looks a bit underdone to me actually, but uh, a little less underdone than that, but pink in the middle, the bit in the middle won't have reached 60 degrees Celsius and that could contain E. coli O157 producing its shiga toxin. You eat that lovely uh, burger, which doesn't look very lovely to me, but you eat that burger and then you've got the stuff in your gut and it grows and produces the toxin. You absorb the toxin, it gets into your cells and then you've got uh, a horrible disease to contend with. I thought what we should have is a sort of list of poos that we can identify. Now I've tried this poo on a number of people today and you didn't know what it was, you didn't know what it was. That, does anybody know what it is? Yes. It could be duck poo. It's chicken poo, actually. I googled chicken poo, <laughs> and this is what I came up with. Now, I'll show you this, because chicken poo contains another uh, bacterium. In fact, all poos contain this particular bacterium, but chicken poo particularly, and this is uh, Campylobacter, Campylobacter jejuni. It can be present in any animals. I have to be very careful because I get told off when I say it's, partic it's particularly chicken. There's more of it in chicken that have a higher chicken load. And the same applies. When the chickens are slaughtered, their meat can get contaminated. And if you cook that meat properly, there's no problem. But look at this situation. You're going to make a nice barbie. It's a lovely summer's night. You marinate the chicken beautifully. This could be me doing this. You marinate it beautifully. A bit of lemon in there, a few herbs bit of sesame it looks, move it round with your tongues and you're off and then you cook it and all the guests are thinking this is fantastic and then you serve it. But you serve it with the same tongues. And of course they have got on them Campylobacter, you then transfer it to the meat and that's not being heated and so then you get a dose of Campylobacteriosis. You might think this is incredibly far-fetched, it isn't. And this was thought to be one of the reasons that the prevalence of Campylobacteriosis in New Zealand is so high. And around about 10 years ago, when this was discovered by Andrew Hudson at ESR, uh, quite a lot of advisory TV programs or TV adverts were put on about the way you should cook chicken. They're all put on at 12 a.m. at night, the cheap advertising time when nobody's watching. But the other possibility, of course, is it can be transferred from one meat to another. And now there are regulations in butchers that chicken meat must be kept separate from cooked meats, and there should be a glass partition between the two to stop that transfer. And as a result of some of those changes, the incidence of Campylobacter has gone down very significantly in New Zealand, which is actually quite impressive, uh, I think. But then there's another one, and I'll show you this one for a very specific reason. This is my scaremongering section now, and if we had, a, an, or, if we had an orchestra in the orchestra pit down here, they'd be doing the drum roll at this stage now. Yes, do it. We need a drum roll. Thank you. <laughs> that was actually quite good. Thank you. This is Clostridium botulinum, which produces a toxin called botulinum toxin. You probably heard about that. Uh, Fonterra had a bit of a non-problem with it, but they thought it was a problem, which nearly killed the uh, milk industry in New Zealand. The lethal dose is 50 nanograms. That's the tiniest amount. That's invisible. You need a microscope to see that. Its toxin is a protein, and it's produced on a plasmid. Drum roll again. What happens if that, pl thank you. What happens if that plasmid got transferred to E. coli? Oh boy, that would be a very nasty situation. Unfortunately, it probably will. So that's my microbiology bit. I feel happy now that I've actually set the scene that microbiological contamination is important. And we've looked at some of the more important bacteria in New Zealand. But I want to answer the question, is New Zealand uh, food safe microbiologically? And the answer is absolutely categorically yes, providing you cook it properly. And I was reading just a few weeks ago about one of the major transfers of Campylobacter in the kitchen. It's when, and this is quite funny, because I remember when my mum was alive, I asked her this question. Mum, what do you do before you roast a chicken? Well, I wash it. Why do you wash it, mum? Well, it's got to be clean, isn't it? Because you wash it under the tap, lots of spraying water, and the Campylobacter's going everywhere. It's much better just to put the damn thing straight in the oven, and it will kill the Campylobacter stone dead. So the cooking process is really very important indeed in that context. We all know that. But we need to look at it scientifically as well. And this is an honours student of mine did this work some years ago. And she showed by plotting the level of exposure, i.e. the exposure against the severity of the hazard, i.e. the hazard, and therefore the line up the middle here, da -da 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 -da, down there, is the risk. 
And if you look at, this is New Zealand, not necessarily food actually, it's New Zealand risks. The big killers are cancer and heart disease, so that was a good indicator that we got the calculations right, because they came out in exactly the right place. And look where the foodborne illnesses are. They're all down the bottom. So that's proving to us that foodborne illness in New Zealand is a very low risk. We can make it lower, and we want to make it lower. And the Ministry of Primary Industries spend a lot of money and time trying to achieve that. This is the bit I like. Let's start talking about the chemistry and some of the chemicals in food. Now I'm going to talk for about four hours on this, so we might just take a break a bit later on so you can have a, a stretch. Just a few facts first. Some of the bacterial toxins are heat stable. I'm not going to talk about those. So they can have uh, acute effects. If you eat the food with the toxin in, you can get the effect straight away rather than the bacteria growing in your gut. Natural toxins can cause both acute and chronic effects, and we'll talk about one of those in a, few, well, a couple of those in a few minutes' time. Chemical contaminants can have very, very long-term effects. They rarely, I can't think of an example of an acute effect of a chemical contaminant. Somebody will think of one, I'm sure. Then there are colours, flavours and preservatives, which I'm not going to talk about today. I originally planned to, but I won't have enough time. So let's look at an example. A rather nice, ex well, not nice if you're the person, but an interesting example. New Zealand, February 2002. This is like one of those, one of those news things that you have in the war. 14 people ill. And this is a sort of common feature of anything to do with me when I'm talking. It's always diarrhoea and vomiting. There's never anything else. Nobody's ever happy. They're always diarrhoea and vomiting all over the place. And these people really were very ill indeed. And I was involved in investigating this case when I used to work over at ESR. And we went to talk to them to ask them what they'd been doing, eating, exposed to. And every single one of them, they're all eating all sorts of stuff. But the one thing that was absolutely common throughout the whole thing was zucchini or courgettes. And I thought, ah, this is just a bit of a red herring, nothing to do with it. So we went back again and asked them more questions, see if we could find something else in common. And every single time, as a new case came along, they'd always eaten courgettes. So we asked them a bit more about the courgettes. And strangely, they'd all been grown by two, I think it was two, might have been three, organic growers. But they were all organic growers, which actually seemed even worse then, because, you know, organic courgettes, that must be the best. And when they'd eaten them, they'd said they tasted a bit bitter. And I said, well, why did you eat them then? And they said, well, they're so expensive because they're organic. We weren't going to throw them away. <laughs> but let's look at what was happening. Courgettes are very susceptible. I'm sure a lot of you grow them. I do. Very susceptible to fungi. And you know that horrible feeling when you walk into the veggie garden and they're covered in fungi. And this fungus is killed by fungicides and non-organic farmers use lots of fungicides, so their courgettes don't get the fungus. Organic farmers don't use uh, fungicides, and so their courgettes get the fungus. But the courgettes are not going to be beaten by this, because they produce their own fungicide, which is called cucurbitacin. There are three of them, actually. And I think this is cucurbitacin J, I can't remember, but I think it is. And these are called phytoalexins, so they're natural products produced by the plants in response to fungal or insect attack, to kill the fungus or insect, or to stop the damage that those things cause. These are horrifically toxic and taste incredibly bitter. And that's what the people have been poisoned by. They'd been poisoned by cucurbitacin present in the courgettes that they'd eaten from organic farms. That was a bit of a turn up for the books. So just continuing that thinking a little bit more, there are a whole load of other uh, phytoalexins produced by plants, and this is a, another example of one. Uh, parsnips produce uh, two uh, compounds, actually. They're both furocumarins, a compound called sorolin, and a compound called bergaptan. I put the chemical structures up for two reasons. One is I'm a chemist, and I feel like I should show chemical structures. But secondly, I want later on to look at some of the shapes of these molecules and recognise their shapes and what they might do. At this stage, it doesn't matter very much. But if you look at these parsnips here, They've been damaged, and you can see the damaged areas, and we all see that when you pick up parsnips, so I've got sort of dark area on them. And that dark area is where these furocumarins are produced. And they're produced in response to damage or attack or fungal attack to prevent uh, further attack. So let's just have a look at um, parsnips a little bit more closely, or, or, or members of that family, actually. If you look at the levels of furocumarins, in celery, for example, parsley, because they're all the same family, and parsnips. Look at the levels in parsnips. 
from 40 to 17,400 milligrams per kilogram. And I bet the 17,000, uh, 1,740 rather, uh, level is in a, in a parsnip that was really badly damaged. And I bet it was an organic parsnip. <laughs> Just to prove that point, if you look at the, I'm not anti-organic, I think you all think I am already, I'm not actually. In fact, I do all this sort of organic-y stuff at home. But you've got to just think a little bit about the risk and benefit of these things. So if we look at the furocumarins in different types of parsnips, a conventional parsnip, i.e. a parsnip that's been produced by an ordinary farmer who goes out and sprays everything completely, has got a lower level. A conventional damaged parsnip, because the parsnip, even though it's been sprayed, still responds to damage by producing some furocumarins, has a higher level. An organic parsnip has a lower level than the conventional damage, but higher than the conventional, but an organic damage. Wow, look at that. That's the 1,740 level. So I think it shows quite nicely that some of these um, toxins are present in plants, produced as a response to damage, and can really be quite toxic. And you're probably thinking, well, what do these things do? Furocumarins are potent carcinogens, and they cause skin cancer. And they only cause skin cancer if you're out in the sun because the molecular changes that need to occur in the furocumarin molecule before it can interact with DNA and cause cancer require ultraviolet light. So in the summertime, you eat your parsnips, all this stuff goes in your skin, you're zapping it and making lovely, lovely carcinogens. Parsnips are off the menu, I reckon. We'll continue taking things off the menu, one at a time, <coughs> until there's nothing else worth eating and then life will be safe, because you'll be dead. So let's have a look at some other aspects of New Zealand. Don't forget, I'm giving you all the nasty examples here. You know, there are lots more good ones. New Zealand, beautiful place, loved the place, came here uh, 16 years ago, never regretted it for a second. I mean, look at that. But this thing here is called a volcano, and volcanoes produce all sorts of awful uh, elements which get spewed out into, onto the land. And of course, in times gone by, these volcanoes were very, very much more active than they are now. So our land is composed of an elemental mixture which is different to non-volcanic lands. One of the things that's missing, and we're going to talk about the things that are there in a minute because they're the nasties, but one of the things that's missing is phosphate. So the levels of phosphate in Ireland are quite low. So in order to farm, produce crops, well, you need to add phosphate. And we tend to use superphosphate or other phosphate-containing um, materials. And here's a farmer putting phosphate onto the land. Now, of course, since there isn't much phosphate in New Zealand, you can't mine the phosphate in New Zealand, so we mine it in other countries and import it from other countries. You might have heard on the news recently that we're importing a lot of this from sub-Saharan Africa and uh, also from... Uh, China and from uh, Australia. But the problem is those parts of the world have high levels of cadmium. And cadmium is highly toxic and a carcinogen, so it causes cancer. So we import the phosphate to make superphosphate, to put on the field to make our crops grow, and at the same time we're importing cadmium and putting it onto the land. So let's have a little bit of a look at cadmium more closely. Cadmium occurs in the environment, it's got two charges, it's CD2+, for the chemist amongst you, and it binds to anything negatively charged. So clay particles it binds to quite strongly, and clay particles form silt, and silt gets washed down rivers, and the rivers go into the sea, and the silt goes into the sea. And creatures like oysters and mussels, which are filter feeders, filter some of that silt. They take all the nutrients and stuff out of the water that they're filtering, and the silt rests in their tissues and the cadmium drops off and binds to proteins in their tissues. So these two creatures are higher in cadmium than most other things. We'll see that in a few minutes' time. In our bodies and in um, animals' bodies, there are two organs that are particularly important for cadmium. One is the liver and one is the kidney. They both filter out cadmium and bind it to a big protein and it stays in those tissues. It's a way of detoxifying it, it's a way of removing it uh, from the from the animal's body. But of course, if we eat the liver or we eat the kidneys, we're likely to get a higher dose of uh, cadmium. And let's have a look at that. Here's some data from New Zealand food. And you can see, if you look at bread, there's a certain level of uh, cadmium in New Zealand, uh, milk. And then I've put these in red because they're very much higher levels compared with the rest of the world. So in the rest of the world overseas, this is the average, actually, of any country I could find, to be honest with you, uh, 0 084 milligrams per kilogram of lamb's liver, 
in New Zealand 0.1 and oysters 1.3 compared with 0.35. And I should really have potatoes in red because there's quite a high level in potatoes, but it doesn't differ much overseas. But that's a reasonably high level, and you'll see that's quite important in a few minutes' time. So cadmium is present in New Zealand at higher levels because of our volcanic activity and because we're importing cadmium uh, containing phosphates for our fertilizers. So if you look in New Zealand food, you can see, and it's very obvious, the cadmium is mainly present in oysters, and you're probably thinking now, but I don't eat many oysters, and that's good because you don't get much cadmium then, and in fact you advise not to eat a vast number of oysters because of the cadmium intake. In potatoes, uh, mussels to some extent, bread because it's present in wheat to some extent, and whatever other foods means, I don't know. But it just shows you the, the span. And you can do more calculations around that and look at the levels in New Zealand oysters, for example, compared with oysters from other parts of the world. And you can see the New Zealand oysters have got an awful lot more than the rest of the world. I know what you're all thinking. Why is that so low? Well, I had this sort of horrible feeling this afternoon. I was looking through these slides. I thought, God, why is that? I don't know the answer. Somebody will ask me. Oh, my God, it's the end of the world. And I tried to take it out, and you can't. Because <laughs> it's a Ministry of Primary Industries graph, and they don't let you change them. Otherwise, you might massage the data. So I phoned them. And apparently, in 1990, you probably remember this, 1990 to 1991, there was a viral disease of uh, oysters in New Zealand. And very few New Zealand oysters were harvested. So most of the oysters consumed in New Zealand were from other countries. And that's an artifact uh, that that level is so low. So if we look at the dietary exposure to uh, cadmium in New Zealand, remembering, of course, it's a carcinogen, which means it wouldn't have its effect for a very long period of time. Very, very long period of time indeed. I've got two groups of people here. Forget this for a minute. I've got two groups of people here, 25 plus males, and we use them not because we're sexist and horrible and I'm a bloke, because they are the high consumers. That's the age at which you eat most food, so it's the worst possible case. And we always look at children around about one to six uh, because they're also a worst case example because they're high consumers. And if you look at the actual levels of um, cadmium in milligrams per kilogram body weight in a diet including oysters and diet without oysters, you can see a difference in adults but not a difference in children. That's because children don't eat oysters. But if you look at this horrible, toxicologists have horrible terms. And I find this one hard to say, the provisional tolerable monthly intake, the PTMI, which is the maximum amount that you can take in a month and have no effect of it whatsoever. And it's called provisional because these are set by a, a world committee called Codex, and they never agree. So at the end of every meeting, it's, oh, let's call it provisional. And then it stays like that forever. And you very rarely see a final uh, value. But if you look at the percentage that these are of that, they're really very high. And that's showing that um, cadmium intake in New Zealand is up there. It's uh, significant. It's not the end of the world. But there's one thing that's very important, that's selenium, which is another element. And selenium is really important in stopping cadmium causing cancer. So if you've got lots of selenium in your diet and a lot of cadmium, they balance out. So we need to explore that a bit. So if the cadmium to selenium ratio is high, it's bad, because that means there's loads of cadmium and not much selenium. If the cadmium to selenium ratio is low, it's good, because that means there's not much cadmium and a load of, of selenium. So let's have a look. If you look at the cadmium selenium ratio in the North Island and the South Island, you can see that it's good in the North Island and bad in the South Island. And this is just looking at a series of uh, grain-based products, because selenium is present particularly in grain. Those data, I can't remember the date, yeah, 2005. And I'll show you them, because since then, we now blend wheat from North and South Ireland and import wheat from Canada and Australia, where the selenium levels are higher. And apparently, I've never seen any data there, but I talked to the MPI about this, these values are now coming together. And so the selenium levels in South Ireland are now going up, which is balancing that cadmium toxicity. And that's a very important intervention that we can do to try and minimise the long-term effects of some of these chemicals. I'll quickly whip through a, a few more um, metals because they're quite interesting uh, in a New Zealand context, I think. This is a beauty. Mercury, I love it. Horrible. Two sorts of mercury, inorganic mercury and organic mercury. They're both neurotoxic. They cause brain damage. 
and they cause developmental toxicity to children and the developmental toxicity is almost exclusively to do with development of the brain. But the toxicity of the two, the organic form and the inorganic form, is really very different. The organic form is, you can only use the word lethal. The inorganic form is extremely toxic. So this is the one we want to minimise exposure to. The problem is that the inorganic form, if it's present in the environment, is converted to the organic form. So slowly we're producing more and more uh, organic mercury in the environment. Where is it coming from? It's coming from all sorts of places. It's naturally present in the environment, all metals are. But we also, it's mined, and this is a, a very unimpressive looking mine uh, in China. And it's mined as cinnabar, which is this, and the mercury is produced from it, and it's used extensively in manufacturing these sorts of lights. And I thought it was quite funny when the last government were trying to make us all use these lights, and no one said, but how about the mercury? Because by producing more of these lights, we're stimulating more mining, which means that more mercury is going into the environment. And when it gets into the environment, it gets into the sea. And when it gets into the sea, particularly organic mercury, which is soluble in fat, it gets taken up by the little critters, critters at the bottom of a food chain. They, lots of them get eaten by the bigger critters, and lots of them get eaten by the even bigger critters. And right at the top, there's a humongous critter which eats a whole load of these, and all the time the mercury concentration is going up and up and up. So one of the worst foods for mercury content is tuna. And this has been a problem uh, for children, as you'll see in a minute, because tuna used to be, and still is to some extent, very often used in these little horrible tins of food you can buy for babies, which I don't think are very nice. But that's a, a non-baby person opinion. So why is organic mercury so toxic? We need to look at a few more chemical structures to illustrate that. So this is an amino acid for the chemists amongst you, or the biochemists. And we've all got loads of this in our proteins and circulating free. And methyl mercury, which is an organic form of mercury, combined to that group to produce this wonderful thing called methyl mercury cysteinyl complex. Now, you're probably thinking, why do we need to know this? Actually, I don't know, but I'll tell you. This is another amino acid called methionine. And methionine is an essential amino acid that's absolutely essential for the brain. And there are specific carriers on the surface of uh, the blood-brain barrier that take this across the blood-brain barrier into the brain so it can be used for all the things that the brain needs methionine for. And if you look at methylmercury, there's a very great similarity. And that blood-brain barrier carrier system confuses the cysteinyl methylmercury complex for uh, methionine and takes it into the brain, which is why it's so toxic to the brain. So let's have a look at dietary exposure uh, to methylmercury in New Zealand. If you look at the total diet, there's around about 0.33 micrograms per kilogram in 25 plus year old males and 0.52 in little toddlers, but we need to know what the PTWI uh, is. And the PTWI for methylmercury is 1.6 micrograms per kilogram body, which is tiny. And we're looking at fairly high percentages again. So in little kids, it's 33%. And there was an advisory out about little kids not eating too much uh, fish for just uh, those reasons. If you look at dietary intakes around the world, you can see the dietary intake of mercury is quite high in New Zealand. So it's a specific uh, food safety issue for New Zealand. It's also high in France. It's also relatively high in China and high in the Basque country. And the commonality between those uh, four countries is they eat a lot of fish. And that's where the mercury uh, comes from. It doesn't mean you shouldn't eat fish. Just quickly look at arsenic. Another good toxicology thing, isn't it, arsenic? And no toxicologist can give a lecture without talking about arsenic. This is really quite interesting because there are two forms, the inorganic form and the organic form. And one of the organic forms is called arsenobetaine. But this time the toxicity is the other way around. The inorganic arsenic is very toxic and the organic arsenic is a lot less toxic, in fact not toxic. Arsenic is carcinogenic, so we don't want to get too much arsenic. Where is it coming from? It's coming from uh, preserved woods, and they're preserved with uh, copper arsenate. This isn't particular to New Zealand, but we use a lot more of it in New Zealand than a lot of other countries do. In a lot of other countries now, copper is replacing the uh, copper arsenate because of the toxic effects of, um, of copper arsenate. This then leaches out of these um, 
products into the environment, into the soil and into our plants. Just looking at the doom and gloom, this isn't it? Do you have a bit of happiness in a minute? If you look at the toxicity, which is measured in LD50, which is the amount of the compound needed to kill 50% of a population of rats. We don't do this anymore. These are old data, but they make the point. Inorganic arsenic, 34 milligrams per kilogram body weight of the rat. And look at the others, much higher. So this is really horrifically toxic. You don't need much of it to kill a rat. This, you need very large quantities uh, to kill a rat. And that just makes the point that the organic arsenics are nowhere near as toxic. Where do you find them? And I find these data quite interesting. If you look in fish fingers, battered fish, canned fish, fresh fish, mussels and oysters, you find very different levels. I've highlighted the red ones because they're the ones that are more likely to be produced within our country because they are fresh. The fish fingers are quite likely to have been imported and the canned fish is very likely to have been imported. And the two imported ones have got much lower levels of arsenic than the ones actually uh, produced in New Zealand. And that's probably because the different levels, the higher levels of arsenic in our environment. So why is uh, inorganic arsenic more toxic? And again, it's because it looks like another molecule. Here's organic arsenic, here's inorganic arsenic, here's phosphate. And, you know, you don't need a Nobel Prize in chemistry to see that these two are really quite similar. Phosphate is taken up by cells actively, and so arsenate is taken up because it fools the cell into thinking it's phosphate. That doesn't, and it doesn't get taken up very well. So where is arsenic found? And it's interesting because it's in New Zealand, Australia, and the Basque country, which is quite intriguing because these are all fish-eating countries and arsenic is present in fish. Now, it doesn't explain, I'm not going to go into this actually, why the levels are lower in China and um, France. There are, there are reasons for that which I can't uh, go into. But it just shows that fish association uh, with arsenic. Do a quick calculation just to show you the issues, and it's quite an interesting issue, this. If you look at the amount of arsenic we take in, it's about 11.5 micrograms per kilogram body weight per week, and you can see that from the last graph. 2 to 7% of that uh, in fish is this inorganic arsenic, so that's the nasty one. Most of it's organic arsenic, which is a safe one. So the dietary exposure to inorganic arsenic is around about 1.3 to 3.1%, i.e. 2 to 7% of that. And if you look at the, forget the word former for a minute, but the World Health Organization provisional tolerable weekly intake for arsenic is 1.4 micrograms per kilogram body weight, so we're exceeding it. Uh, in New Zealand. But interestingly, a lot of countries exceed it, so the WHO withdrew that number and they're still thinking about it now because they've got to get it higher somehow because it's very difficult to do anything about that exposure because it's in the environment. We can't change it, uh, unfortunately. Turn to something completely different, which is my personal uh, research area, but it's a very food-related issue and an issue not only for New Zealand but for the rest of the uh, world as well. My students think this looks like me. I don't. <laughs> I think I look more like the one that should have been in the background. Why are you laughing? Was that akin to heckling? <laughs> so a measure of that is the sperm count. And if you look at the sperm count around the world, this was published in 1992 uh, by Gwen Carlson, there's a, been a decrease in sperm counts. And you're probably thinking, the blokes out there thinking, oh yes, but we are New Zealanders. You know, our sperm count is going up. Well, it isn't. There's a New Zealand sperm count. It's gently going down as well. So the question is, why is that happening? And there's some really quite interesting reasoning behind that. If anyone's heard me talk before, I've talked about this before. And it's all to do with women. And they are always the problem on these occasions. <laughs> aren't they? This is a dangerous place to be to say that. So this is the female hormone, 17 beta estradiol, nice structure, hydroxyl group here, hydroxyl group there, lots of hydrophobic stuff in the middle. Just think of the structure of that molecule. It binds to a big receptor right in the middle here, and that's the thing that turns cells into female. It binds in a way that we fully understand, and this is just an enlargement of that binding site. And we can look at exactly how it binds to that 
receptor won't go into it, but we can see the hydroxyl group binds at this end, another hydroxyl group at this end, and the wiggly bit in the middle interacts with those cells very clearly indeed. And we can now actually say exactly what's necessary for that to bind, and we can say what the distance between that and that has to be, what the angle of these has to be, and that's extremely well understood. But there are other molecules that look a bit like estrogen. And here's an example. This is a compound called genistein, which is present in soy. So every time you eat soy, you eat some genistein. And genistein has a surprisingly similar look to estrogen. If I get rid of those pictures, you can see quite clearly. And if I do the clever stuff I like doing, I'll do that again because I like that. There we are. You can see that they look really quite similar. The hydroxyl groups line up. The wiggly bit in the middle is about the same. And genistein will sit in the estrogen receptor and feminize that cell. And that sort of thing is why the sperm count's going down, because we're being exposed to more and more uh, soy. You're probably thinking, I don't eat soy. Just remember that bread in New Zealand contains around about 3% soy uh, flour, so you have eaten it probably. I'm only going to look at two molecules. There are hundreds more. The, the World Health Organization has listed 800 uh, in a report recently. Here's another one. Bisphenol A is present. It's used in polycarbonate plastics, and they're used for all sorts of stuff but they're used to line uh, the cans that food come in, and that bisphenol A will leach out into the food. Again, looking at its structure, you can see the similarities between the two. It fits into the estrogen receptor and fools it that the estrogen is around. Just so you know that it's not only coming from food, it's the plastic that's used to make glasses, spectacles, glass. It's used to coat um, till receipts, and it's used to make these lovely fillings that my dentist is moving all these nasty ones and putting all of these in and I keep saying, yeah, stop doing that, but I've got my mouth full of his hands and I can't tell him. And he knows that. And just to show that we do actually absorb these things, for example, from till receipts, the top, just look at the top uh, slide here. This is bisphenol A in um, cashiers in a supermarket in the USA um, after t the time after they came onto their shift. And look at the BPA levels in their blood going up. And it's just because they're saying, would you like your receipt, madam? Would you like your receipt, sir? And they're absorbing it through their skin. Why and who does it affect? It doesn't affect child-bearing uh, age women. Because child-bearing age women have great changes in their levels of estrogen. And those great changes in estrogen levels mean that they can cope with those changes. So a little bit of an estrogenic compound like bisphenol A or genistein will make no difference. But postmenopausal women, men and pre-puberty girls have a level around about here. And those small amounts of estrogenic compound in food and from other aspects of the environment will actually significantly add to that. And so the effects are seen mainly in them, particularly in men, which is why we think the sperm count uh, is on the way down. The big issue, and it is a really big one, is the cocktail effect. I could do with a cocktail now, and you probably could as well. And all of these different... E good illustration there. I'm very proud of this. Uh, all of these estrogenic compounds add up because they all bind to the same receptor. And I've got a PhD student working with me at the moment, Sam Dudley, who did some really exciting experiments in, uh, in Amsterdam where she showed categorically that if you expose cells to mixtures of these things, they all add up. But we regulate them as individual compounds. So we're going to have to think again, I think. One more example of an estrogenic compound is a thing called... Um, Dibutyl phthalate, and I've got another PhD student who's sitting here who's working on di the phthalates generally, but dibutyl phthalate, uh, Pravesh Tyagi. And these compounds used to be used but aren't any longer in cling films, and they made them stretchy. We use different compounds now. They were banned because of their profound estrogenic effects. But if you look at the structure of estrogen, you're good enough chemists, if you're not already chemists, to recognize that they're nothing like each other. So these don't work by binding, we don't think so, by binding to the estrogen receptor. They do something completely different. And this is some work that a previous master's student of mine did. He just uh, graduated with an A+, plus, clever clogs. Uh, Nick McKitterick. Cholesterol is the precursor for the male hormone, testosterone, goes through a series of steps. And believe it or not, and a lot of people don't, testosterone breaks down to produce uh, estradiol, the female hormone. So women actually manufacture their hormone via testosterone. There are two enzymes which carry out these two reactions, and they're coded for by two genes. 
and the genes are called HSD17B3 and CYP19A1. Uh, and we've actually looked at what happens to these genes, their expression, whether they go up or down, if cells are exposed to dibutyl phthalate. And very interestingly, if you expose cells to dibutyl phthalate, the expression of that gene goes down and the expression of that gene goes up, which means that in a male cell, they don't make as much testosterone, but they break more of it down. And so the testosterone levels go down, and we've shown that now. And so therefore, that would also be a feminizing effect. So blokes, you don't stand a chance. The women are going to win. This is the ultimate in biochemical feminism. And very finally, just for the last second, something I just love is champagne. I mean, you can't live without champagne, can you? And I just, can you? I hope not. <laughs> Does anybody live without champagne? You don't live. No, good God, just people go, no. You, well, you need to start. You need to get some, get some champagne. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Pat, I've just said something very naughty about me. You have to wait a year, and then you can, then you can try it. And the other thing that's lovely, which you can have, actually, is smoked salmon. So those two things together are something I just love to have. So let's just have a look at smoked food for a few minutes. Because smoked food is smoked. <laughs> Which is just like you might do with a cigarette, actually. And it's smoked like this. It's hung up over all these smoky chips. And there's a whole load of chemicals that come out in that smoke. And here's just a little connection of them. And again, the chemist or toxicologist in the audience should be thinking, oh my god. These are lethal, and they're lovely. If you look at their carcinogenicity, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but a good proportion of those compounds have been shown to be carcinogenic in different animal species. So even the thing that I just love is really not safe. But you've got to think what you enjoy, a bit of what you like does you good. So the benefit is really worth that risk. So what I've tried to do, I've tried to go through food Focus a bit on some of the nasty sides because it's more interesting than not. But I think I've shown that there are some aspects of food safety which are quite New Zealand specific and the problem's bigger in New Zealand. Others are worldwide. But there is a general increase in chemical toxicity in foods. But I'll just leave you with one thought and it's a really important one. New Zealand food is probably quite low risk but not eating is certainly high risk. So don't stop eating because of what I said. Thank you for listening. Thank you.